But today we're in, in 1 Samuel chapter 9, and uh, we're going to be looking at this chapter together as, as Saul becomes the king of Israel, right? He's about, he's about to be, um, become king. They're demanding a king, and, and God is going to allow them to have Saul. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2, and then we're going to get into our study, and we'll pick up at verse 1 and then move on and ultimately conclude the chapter. But beginning at verse 1, verses 1 and 2, there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Bilibob, no, Zeror, the son of Becherot, the son of Aphia, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power, and he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. And so what we have here is an introduction of a man by the name of Saul, but let's remember what has taken place here. Up to this time, the nation of Israel has been led by judges and prophets, and, and Samuel is the last judge. Samuel has now grown older. Uh, we read last time that he had become old. He probably was around 60 years of age. He had a couple of boys, a couple of sons, Joel and Abiah, and the nation of Israel have rejected them. And the reason that the nation of Israel has rejected them is because they were just uh, dishonest men. They, they went after bribes and they perverted justice and they had been judging in a, an area called Beersheba. And the, and the elders of Israel gathered together to reject these sons. You see, God had anticipated a request like this. Because in the rejection of the sons as judges, they also were making a demand for a king. Something that was not a surprise to God, because God had anticipated that in the Old Testament. I mean, when you read the Bible, you have the first five books of the Bible. The fifth book of the Bible is the book of Deuteronomy. And there in that book, in chapter 17, verses 18 and 19, God begins to give the behavior of the king. And he says the king is to have a scroll of the law that he writes, he copies, and he's supposed to judge the people according to that law. He was to read it, he was to love it, he was to know it, and he was to judge righteously according to it. They were to have, he was to have a fear of God, and, and it was the fear of God that would keep him a righteous judge. It was to have the fear of God and, and a love for and a knowledge of his word that would make him possible, make it possible for him to rule well. Everybody knows that, that when good men and good women occupy positions of authority, uh, things can go a lot better. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 29, verse 2, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. And so when you have a good person in authority, things are going well and will go well for the nation. But when somebody who is evil is, is, uh, is ruling, and things don't go so well and then people get depressed. Uh, Solomon wrote uh, books of the Bible, and he wrote songs. He also wrote psalms, and uh, in Psalm uh, 72, verses 1 and 2, which is a psalm of Solomon, he said, Give the king your judgments, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son. He will judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. And so a, a righteous ruler is going to cause the people to be in a place to be blessed by God. An unrighteous ruler causes them to groan. Well, Samuel is displeased. He's displeased when the people come and approach him and say, we don't want your sons to rule over us. And, and he takes it personally, but he takes the prayer request to the Lord, and he speaks to God about it. And God makes it very clear to him that uh, they are not rejecting you, Samuel. In effect, they're really are rejecting me because the people wanted to have a king who would rule over them. We saw that in chapter 8 when it said in verses 19 and 20, we will have a king over us that we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And so in reality what they were saying is they're saying we don't want to be under the law. We don't want to be under the law of Moses because we know that the king to rule righteously is one who would be under his law. And in, in effect what you're seeing here is them saying something like we want a separation of church and state. That's basically what they're saying. We don't want God to rule over us. 
We want a separation between God and ourselves. Now, they wanted a centralized form of government because the Philistines actually had five main cities that had five rulers who worked as a composite in the rulership over the people of, of uh, Philistia. They want to have a centralized government, and they believe that a king uh, can be the person who's the answer to that problem. And so that's what it's all about right now. And they're, uh, they're wanting to have a king appointed. And so we're introduced to this king here in chapter 9. Now notice with me, in chapter 9, verse 1, first we have the identity of this particular person. His name is Kish, and he's from the tribe of Benjamin. When you read your Old Testament, you discover that God had uh, divided the nation of Israel into 12 tribes. Benjamin was uh, the youngest son of Jacob, from which the 12 tribes originate. And Benjamin was his favorite son. He loved his son, Benjamin. Benjamin is a small tribe, but Benjamin, as a tribe, had great influence. And so you're seeing a man who's from the tribe of Benjamin, a man by the name of Kish. And notice we, with me in verses 1 and 2 how it says, He was a mighty man of power. He had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not a more handsome person than he among all the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the, of the people. And so what we have here is we have a man who has a tremendous amount of unearned qualities. As you look at Saul and you're introduced to him, notice that this man here has unearned qualities, several of them. This is a guy who could win the People's Choice Award. This is a person that they really liked, and there were reasons why. One, verse 1 says that, that Kish was a mighty man of power. That's another way of saying that his father was a man of influence and wealth. He had influence and wealth. It's interesting to me how that even today people will, are more, are more um, taken by those who have influence and wealth. We have a tendency of that. That's just the way it is. Uh, even though Saul had nothing to do with the father's influence and wealth. I remember uh, a long time ago I was reading something about a man who was a very successful man. He was a very wealthy man, a businessman. And he was being interviewed. He was being interviewed by somebody who asked him, how did you come to have all your wealth? And the man said, well, when I was around 10 years of age, I used to get up early in the morning and I would get my shoe box on Saturdays and Sundays and I would go out to the store and I would be there in front of the store and people who would walk in, I would ask them if I could shine their shoes and I would charge them a nickel. And so I did that for a long time and every nickel that I made, I put in a little bag and I took the bag, eventually put it in the bank and I invested it. As I got older, I started going to school. I graduated from high school. I went to college. I majored in business. I got my master's of economics, and, and I started businesses. And so the man interviewing him said to him, so that's how you became wealthy? And he says, oh, no, no, that's not how I became wealthy. I became wealthy when my father, who was a millionaire, died and left all of his money to me. And that's kind of how it works, you know. We have a tendency of thinking, well, that person's wealthy. Well, in the case of, of Saul, he did nothing to gain that wealth. My kids, when they were little, would say to me, oh, I have a friend who's, his dad, my, my kids would actually say this, my friends have, are, are very rich. And I'd say, your friends are rich? Yeah, I have a friend, dad, who's really rich. And I said, well, where'd he get the money from? He said, well, from his dad. I said, then your friend's not rich, his dad is. You know, and that's kind of how it works. You know, a lot of times kids think that they're rich because whatever dad has belongs to them. Well, in the case of Saul, Saul was from an influential, wealthy lineage. His dad was a mighty man. His dad was a well-respected, influential man. But Saul had nothing to do with that. Had nothing to do with that. And secondly, he's described as being choice and handsome. The word choice there in the Hebrew carries with it the connotation of being young. It's not that he was like 20 or 25 years of age. It's that he was probably 40 or so in his life, and he was still young or at the prime of his age. Not only did he have youth on his side, but he was also a very handsome man, and beyond that, he was tall. This guy had it all. This guy was from a wealthy background. This man was as handsome as they, as they came. He was, he was, he was uh, fairly young, and, and this man was so tall. He was just everything that the average person would admire. The thing is about this, as you look at this, is not a single one of these qualities were the result of anything he had done. But it's the combination of these qualities that are exactly what people use to determine whom they like. 
because people have a tendency of listening to the young, tall, handsome, and wealthy. That's the way it is. That's why nobody listens to me. I mean, they, they will listen to those who are young and handsome and tall and wealthy. And, and that's the bottom line. We, we have that. Listen, that's not something that took place just back in the time of Samuel. I mean, that takes place now. As I was preparing this Bible study, my daughter Corinne came into my office and, and said, Dad, did you know that Brad Pitt addressed Congress? And I said, really? Brad Pitt addressed Congress? She said, yeah, this week. And I said, are you kidding me, really? And she said, yeah. So I, I wanted to see what he had to say. So I Googled, you know, Brad Pitt and Congress. And, and I discovered indeed on, on the 5th of this month, um, he went to Congress to exhort them concerning disaster relief and green collar jobs. And he met uh, national leaders including Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi. And this is what Nancy Pelosi said. This is a quote. It really is an honor to have him here. And I know for some of my staff and for bragging rights to my children and my grandchildren, a real treat for me as well. And I'm thinking, do you mind if I'm honest with you for just a moment? I'm thinking, how dumb is that? How, how excuse me, does that, if that sounds cruel to some in here. How dumb is that? I mean, that, that is, I mean, come on, you're a grandma, and you're looking at this hunk, okay, he's a handsome guy, but please, I mean, you know, go anywhere, I could go with this, I won't, man, just, I, I couldn't believe it, I'm thinking, are you kidding me, that's high school, that's junior high school, I mean, that's the, that's the 12 year old girl seeing the high school senior walk by going, oh, I'm so excited. I mean, come on. This is Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House. But this is way have. Now, why? Because Brad Pitt is a very handsome man. That's why. Because he's a, a, an actor that some people really think is a, a good actor. That's why. What did he have to qualify himself to stand in front of Congress? What degrees does he have? What does he have to bring him so he can say, look, and I've got all of this experience Outside of the fact that he's got a beautiful wife or girlfriend, I guess. I don't think he's married to her. What is there to commend him? No, I'm not knocking Brad Pitt. I bet he's a real nice guy. I just find it interesting to note that we still are that way as a nation. We will bring the Hollywood stars and the good-looking people and Bono and all the rest to come up and, and lecture us concerning how we ought to run our government and things we ought to do people who really haven't shown us anything in terms of the things that they have done over a lifetime to achieve the credibility that demonstrates the character that causes a person like me to say, I can line up behind you because you have what it takes. But the nation that we live in is a nation like Israel. I think it's just a human quality. I wonder how many of you guys have ever heard of a man by the name of J. Vernon McGee. Anybody ever hear? Raise your hand. I want to know. See, a lot of you have never heard of J. Vernon J. Vernon McGee was a champion for the things of God for many years. He died in his 80s, uh, a number of years ago now. And when I first got saved, I used to listen to J. Vernon on the radio. He was on, like I used to say, he's on every radio station in the world. I mean, this man's voice was heard everywhere. And he was a southerner, so he spoke with that, that southern drawl, and he used to call us beloved, you know, my beloved, you know, and we're getting on the Bible bus, you know, and then he'd take us through a trip through the, the scriptures in five years. That was J. Vernon McGee, a tremendous teacher of the Word of God. And I, and I had a love and affection for this man. Well, he, uh, for many years, has been teaching through the Word of God systematically, and so he has a set of commentaries that are really just transcripts from messages that he has given. And, and, and I use him, I like to... Uh, get some of the, the, uh, the wisdom that he has in his studies and all. And, uh, and it, it, I just so happened to be reading him as it related to, to Samuel. And, and he said something that I found very interesting. And this, this was printed back in 1982. And this is something that J. Vernon McGee said. Now, he would never have called himself a prophet, but I think he's prophetic in this. Because in 1982, J. Vernon McGee wrote, The most dangerous enemy we have is the television. The man that will ultimately control this country is the man who has a good television appearance. Why? Because we choose men by the way they look and the way they talk rather than by their character. If only we had an x-ray instead of the television 
that would reveal the true character of a man. That is absolutely right on. That is absolutely right on. As long as I can remember, we have had a tendency of, of following the ones who are taller, the ones who are better looking, the ones who have wealth and influence as a nation. We have done that all of my lifetime, and I'm sure prior to that, there has always been uh, this pursuing people by outer appearance and not even having a clue about their character. Not a clue about what they actually believe and what they actually do. What, you know, we have a tendency of liking scripted speeches. We have a tendency of liking people who have an appearance in a certain way, but we don't really look to their hearts. We can't. We can't. So we have a tendency of just looking at the outer appearance. I think Jay Vernon was right. We need to look to a person's character. Saul was wealthy. Saul was handsome. Saul was tall. But none of these things were things he earned in life. What he didn't have was character. And we're going to see that because here in chapter 9 following, we are starting to eclipse Samuel, and you're going to begin seeing more of, of Saul. And so we're going to be seeing this man's life in some detail. Now, in verse 3, Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to his son Saul, Please, take one of the servants with you and arise. Go and look for the donkeys. So he passed through the mountains of Ephraim and through the land of Cilicia, but they did not find them. Then they passed through the land of Shanana, no, Sha'alim. I don't know why I say that. I just think that sounds funny. Sha'alim, and they were not there. Then he passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they did not find them. When they had come to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let us return, lest my father cease caring about the donkeys and become worried about us. And he said to him, Look now, there is in this city a man of God, and he is an honorable man. All that he says surely comes to pass, so let us go there. Perhaps he can show us the way that we should go. So as we look at this, this man Kish has a, a, a lot of donkeys and all, and we need to understand that uh, during that time, uh, part of the wealth would be um, determined by the amount of animals you had. And so some of his wealth is disappearing. That's the whole point. He's losing some of his donkeys. And it's an important task. He doesn't want to send just one of his servants. What he does is he chooses to entrust his son to go out and find them. And so Saul takes off to go look for these donkeys to recover his father's wealth. As he does so, he takes one of his servants and off they go. Now they're going into different areas. And the, you know these names here that we have before us, Shalisha and Sha'alim, we really don't know where that is. But it's more than likely just a little bit north of the city of Jerusalem, just north of the city of Ramah, where, uh, where Samuel is from. And so it's in that geographic location there, if you will. And as he's looking around, he can't find the donkeys. And he's a little bit nervous and all, and he's beginning to become afraid. And he's concerned that, that they may get lost. And not only that, you see a little bit of an insight into him at this point, at least, because he's a little concerned that his father is going to get worried about him too. And so what we should do is we go, in verse 6, we should go to a city, the city that there is a man of God in, and he speaks of him as being an honorable man. Now, when he uses the phrase, a man of God, that's another way of saying there's a prophet of God there, because we saw that term in chapter 2, verse 27. So he's going to go and speak to him and ask him for some direction. Well, in verse 7, Saul said to his servant, but look, if, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread in our vessels is all gone, and there is no present to bring to the man of God. What do we have? And the servant answered Saul again and said, Look, I have here at hand one-fourth of a shekel of silver. I, I will give that to the man of God to tell us our way. Now, normally, when they would come for spiritual advice and approach a man of God like Saul was about to do with Samuel, they wouldn't come empty-handed. They would come with a gift. And they would bring food normally, but they don't have any. And so he says, our vessels are empty. I don't have any food to give to him. Do you have anything? And the man says, yes, I have, I have one-fourth of a shekel. Now, right now, that doesn't make sense to us. But know this, that silver was fairly rare during that day. Therefore, what he's going to give to him is actually a, a, a gift that is, a, is, is financially, um, it, it's a, it's a good-sized gift to them at that time, taking into consideration how much money they had and how rare silver was. And so they're giving him a generous gift. 
So that's what they would do. They would go to the man of God and they would give him a gift of food. In this case, they're going to give him some finances. And they're giving him as a gift because they don't want to take advantage of him because they're going to receive direction from him. So it was a normal custom at that time to do. It's funny because that particular custom continued on until the day of Christ. As a matter of fact, that custom continues on in some, in some church traditions to this very day. That people expect you to give them something for any spiritual service that, that you do. I've had people approach me before in the past telling me that they wanted to get married in a certain place, but the minister said, how much are you going to give me for performing the service? And, and they said, that just didn't feel right. It didn't set right with us. And because and some people think that if you do a service spiritually for them, you ought to give them a gift. Well, during the time of... of uh, of Samuel, they would give them a gift and it was a way of supporting them, but it was also something that was prone to corruption. During the time of Christ, you see it in Mark chapter 12, verse 40. During the time of Christ, Jesus was speaking about the religious leaders and he said they devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. That was happening during the time of Christ. For a pretense, they make long prayers. Listen, if, if I were living during the time of Christ, I was a Pharisee, you came to me for prayer. You would approach me. I would expect a gift from you. If you gave me a small gift, you'd get a very short prayer. God help them. See you later. But if you gave me a large gift, then I would make a long prayer for you. And that's what Jesus is talking about. For a pretense, they make long prayers. And so this kind of thing is prone to corruption. You know, to give somebody a gift for doing a spiritual service is prone to corruption, and that's what took place. But during the time of Saul, he's saying, I want to do the proper thing. I want to give to him a gift. What do we have? And they said, well, we have a quarter of a shekel. Well, we can take that to him. I want to give him a gift. Now, it speaks concerning verse 9. Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he spoke thus, Come, let us go to the seer. For he who is now called a prophet was formerly called a seer. Then Saul said to the servant, Well said, come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. Now, Here's something interesting for you. Notice how it says they were formerly referred to as seers. Now, the reason that they were called seers is because they could see the future. So they'd call them seers. They knew or could see the future. The problem with that word, the word seer, is that it also was associated with people who were in the occult. So people who were what we today would call a spiritist or people who were called necromancers, who would call up the spirits of the dead, were also referred to as seers. God didn't like that. And so what you're seeing is you're seeing this is being changed from seer to prophet. Samuel is called a prophet because he becomes the first of an order of prophets. So it's not that there is just a prophet, but they are going to begin to descend after him as an order of prophets. Now a prophet had a ministry where he would foretell and forthtell. Foretell, he could speak of future events. Forthtell, he would speak forth the mind of God to people. And so they would come to him and speak to him so he could tell them the future or give to them insight and direction. Well, verse 11, as they went up the hill to the city, they met some young women going out to draw water and said to them, is the seer here? And they answered them and said, Yes, there he is, just ahead of you. Hurry now, for today he came to this city because there is a sacrifice of the people today on the high place. As soon as you come into the city, you will surely find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat unless he comes, because he must bless the sacrifice. Afterward, those who are invited will eat. Now, therefore, go up, for about this time you will find him. And so he's come to make an offering to the Lord. The people are there waiting for him to do that. They're not going to eat their meals until a prayer of thanks has been offered. So they go to the city. And they come to the city that there was Samuel. And Samuel begins to hear from the Lord. I want you to notice verse 15 here. Notice how it says, Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear the day before Saul came, saying, So this is interesting to me. I want to speak to you about this for just a moment. God spoke to him. Question. Does God still speak? Does God still speak? I want you to see verse 15. The Lord had told Samuel in his ear. It's obvious that this is not something that was just an internal sense. 
This is something God audibly spoke. Does God still speak is the question. The answer is yes, of course he does. How? Through his word. When you pray, you're speaking to God. When you read the Bible, he's speaking to you. God speaks through his word. That's why we read the word of God. Have you ever, I'm sure you have, have you ever been praying and saying, Lord, I need an answer. I need an answer for this. I really don't know what to do. And a scripture will come to mind. You'll remember a Bible verse, something you had read recently. Or maybe you'll open up the word and you'll be, you'll be doing your devotions. You'll be reading through passage and, and you've been asking the Lord for direction. And right in front of you, right in front of you, there it is. There's your answer. And you'll just say, Lord, thank you so much. I really was desiring to hear from you, and I can see this is the direction you would have me to go. Now, some people will pick up the Bible and say, I need an answer, and they'll just spin it open and put their finger down. They call that bibliomancy. You know, I remember hearing of a guy who did that. I need an answer, Lord. I need an answer. Speak to me. And he opened it up, and he put his hand down, and he read it. Judas went out and hanged himself. And he said, I don't really think that that's for me. So he opened it up again and said, Lord, speak to me. Go out and do the same. Now, I'm sure that that is not for me. I, it's a very unwise practice just to open the Bible up and just throw it and just let your eyes set on the first scripture. But what you do is you have a habit of reading and then you've been taking that in and as you take it in, God uses that to communicate to you because you'll say, Lord, I'm in this situation and I don't have any finances and the Lord perhaps and the Lord will say, do you remember when I fed those 5,000? And you go, is there something you want to teach me about that? Well, was I able to provide for them? Yes. Am I able to provide for you? Yes, I believe you can. The Lord has a way of doing that. Do you know what I'm talking about? Have you done that? The Word of God comes alive and speaks to your heart. And, 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 and that, that is a regular, regular occurrence in, in any Christian's life. It's a regular occurrence in mine. I'll say, Lord, I need your direction. As I'm reading through the Word of God, He'll bring something out, or I'll be thinking and meditating and praying, and, and a scripture will come to mind, or He will bring somebody sometimes into my life, a friend or whatever, and they'll speak a word that I know is from the Lord. Many years ago now, here in this fellowship, when our church was less than a year old, I had begun praying, Lord, I, I, I've been teaching topical studies, and I really feel that you want me to teach a book study. I haven't done that on Sunday, but I, I'm not sure that I should start that or not. And, and I remember saying to him, I think you're telling me to, to teach the gospel of Mark. But Lord, if I begin teaching Mark, and I'm in chapter 1, and then I have a visitor who comes the next week, and we're, he didn't get chapter 1, he's going to miss the whole thing. I don't know if you're really telling me to teach Mark or not. I remember this vividly, and I was praying and saying, Lord, I don't know what you would have me to do, but I think you're telling me to teach the gospel of Mark. And as the Lord is my witness, I came to church, and after church, a woman approached me after the service, and this is what she said. I've never forgotten. She said to me, God is saying, teach the gospel of Mark. I'll never forget that. I said, Marie, thank you so much. I do appreciate that. <laughs> no, it was a stranger. I had never met her. I'd never met this woman. She walks up to me and she says to me, God is saying, teach the gospel of Mark. I knew that's the Lord. I'd been seeking the Lord. I, I had the sense and direction of the Lord. Does God do that? I believe that he does. I believe it's consistent with his word. He never gives you something to do that's not found here. But he does open up and share with you in a variety of ways, especially and foremost through his word. Again, our church was very young. It was about four and a half months old. We used to rent a small church building in Ontario called Church of God Seventh Day. It's located on Vine Street, right there by Holt. And... Uh, we had our very first hallelujah party at this small church. We had 20, 25 kids. And what we did is we showed them a little Christian cartoon. We gave them candy. We wanted just to get the kids off the street and give them a Bible lesson and minister to our kids. That's all we wanted to do. And then December came along and we decided to have a children's play. And 
we had a small church of 60 people and so it was a real like family time and the kids were up there in the play and well the church people who owned the building got real upset and kicked us out because they said you guys are cults you're a cult because you celebrate Halloween which we didn't we had an alternative called it the hallelujah party uh, and it was not a Halloween thing at all it was more just get the kids into the sanctuary and let's give them some candy and and Christian songs and, and that's what we did and and then their real problem is is you celebrate Christmas you're pagans well I I didn't know this at the time I found out later on that they were a cult we didn't know that we we thought they were Christians they weren't they were a cult I found that out later on after they had started accusing us of this I began to look into their doctrines and lo and behold I discovered they denied the Trinity and a variety of other things they were a cult but at the same time we had to leave and they said your last time for us that you can use this building is going to be at the end of the uh, at the end of the month of January I was out looking with my assistant pastor to try and find a place for us to meet we only had 60 people but I couldn't find a place that we could afford because we were only spending like hundred and fifty dollars a month to rent this church building and and we didn't we only had sixty people and and frankly we didn't have much money coming in to take care of of those kinds of bills and all and we finally found a place that was open but it was a thousand fifty dollars a month and we just didn't have that we didn't have that kind of money sixty people didn't produce the income to be able to do that and so I, I remember just we were getting to the point where I was just saying Lord I don't know what we're gonna do one Wednesday night it was the middle of of January we only had a couple of weeks to go I remember it was a Wednesday night and we'd been looking for the last few weeks to try and find a place to relocate and couldn't find one I remember my uh, wife Marie was gone with our, our babies and it was just me in the house prior to the Wednesday night Bible study I went into our bedroom and I and I literally fell on my face before the Lord and I began to pray and I actually began to weep before God and I remember praying something like God we only have 60 people but you know they're the most dear people in my life I don't know what to do you're gonna to have to direct us I don't know what we're gonna do we don't have any place that we can go and Lord we only have two weeks and you're aware of this but I'm bringing this before you and I remember praying and crying out to the Lord and it really was something I was greatly concerned about our church was was small and it was new and I, I didn't have any place to take them so I went to the Wednesday study and a, a, a young woman at that time her name was Karen approached me and she looks at me and she says Dave you look like death warmed over do you have a problem I said yeah I said I'm, I'm concerned about something can we pray for you I said after the Bible study please do gave the Bible study my assistant pastor's name was Dan Dan and I sat on chairs in the middle of the front room people surrounded us laid hands on us lifted up the request that God what do you want to do we need a place for this church I went home climbed into bed and as I was laying in bed I heard the voice of the Lord speak to my heart saying you're going to need a place that seats 200 people on Easter Sunday now you have to understand we only had 60 people in our church at that time the thought of 200 people was just like almost well, was tripling the church there's no way that I could imagine seeing that within a month or so month and a half but I said to the voice that spoke to my heart I said that's right I remember falling asleep the next day I was studying for Sunday morning service John 12 24 unless a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die it abides alone but if it dies it brings forth much fruit and I remember praying saying Lord I, I feel like I am dead now a couple of weeks earlier I had written a letter to Pastor Chuck saying Chuck my background is Calvary Chapel I would like to be in association with Calvary Ministries so that we could be a Calvary Chapel because at that time we were calling ourselves Ontario Christian Chapel and so I was there preparing the study when the mailman walked up the front steps the voice of the Lord spoke a second time and said your letter is here I went and took the letters out that were there in the mail and turned one over it said Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa I put it on the side I read everything else I prayed over that letter father if we become Calvary that's great if we don't it's up to you I thank you for whatever it is I'm about to read I opened it up it said welcome to Calvary Chapel uh, fellowship we had a breakfast that following Saturday this was Thursday that following Saturday I announced to all who were there because the whole church used to show up for breakfast and so the church was there I said we're gonna call ourselves Calvary Chapel Ontario beginning tomorrow 
Within a couple of weeks, our church began to grow. Greg Laurie got up and said, there's a church in Ontario. If you're from Ontario, you ought to go to it. It's called Calvary Chapel, Ontario. Some people began to show up. Our church, within a very short time, doubled to 120 people. When it doubled to 120 people, there was enough income for us to go and rent the central school there in the city of Ontario. And we were there on Easter Sunday. And if some of you may be old enough to remember this, it, it was not a highlight of your 1982, but it was mine. So I remember this. It was pouring rain in 1982, Easter Sunday, pouring rain. And as it was pouring, I remember going out there and looking out and to 200 people who were seated there. And I said, you don't know this, but God placed it on my heart a month and a half ago that we would need a place that seats 200 people on Easter Sunday. And it is God who drew you to this place today in fulfillment of his word. I do believe that God does on occasion still speak in such a way. But does he always do it? No. Wouldn't it be cool if he did? Yes. I don't have to read anymore. He'll just talk to me. Doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way. But yes, he does. And in this case, he spoke into his ear. The Lord told Samuel in his ear the day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. You shall anoint him commander over my people Israel, that he may save my people from the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people, because their cry has come to me. So I'm going to send you a man. You're going to anoint him. He's going to become a commander. When you anoint him, that's going to be a symbol to all that he has been anointed for service. He's going to be a commander, the one who is going to be given prominence, the one who is placed in front to rule. And the reason I'm doing this is I have heard their cry. Their cry has come to me. They had been crying out for deliverance from the Philistines, and God says, I have heard them. It's like when you read the book of Exodus, and God begins to speak to Moses. And God, when he's speaking to Moses and calling him into service to deliver the children of Israel from Egyptian bondage, how that the Lord in Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 9 said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good land, a large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites and Jebusites, and Pepsilites and Outosites and Uptites and Cellulites. All of those ites. Now therefore... Behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. The cry of the children of Israel has come to me. Listen. When you cry out to God, you can sometimes think he's not listening. These passages tell me that he is, that he is listening. He may not move as quickly as you want him to. He may not. Most often doesn't, does he? But he does move. Now, sometimes there are things in my life that he has to deal with before he moves. Sometimes there's an issue that I have to resolve before he moves. Sometimes there's a sin thing in my life that the Lord says, listen, I want to move on your behalf and do this, but let's deal with that sin issue first. He does that. He brings conviction, and you repent, you turn away from it, you cry out to the Lord, and he delivers. Listen, these people here that he's delivering have been in gross idolatry and are not even really pursuing him, and yet he says, I hear them, I will deliver them. You are a person who loves the Lord. You're a born-again believer in Christ. What makes you think he won't deliver you? He will deliver you. He will take care of you. He does love you. He is there for you. There's nothing I know more certainly than that. I know that God is on my side. I have no doubt about it. Now, he doesn't always do things as I would. I mean, Jeremiah spoke to the Lord and said, I want to speak to you about your judgment. You know, you do things differently. You know, the psalmist says, I just want to ask you, why do the wicked prosper? I would like to ask you some questions. And the psalmist said that he had those questions and others. He said, until I went to the house of the Lord and then I understood their end. Then I realized some things that I didn't know before. And I realized they don't have a relationship with you. 
But I'll tell you something. You need to walk out with this. God is on your side. God will provide for you. God will care for you. God is there for you because God loves you. He will not abandon you. He will not forsake you. He will not leave you all alone. There have been times, and I can tell you before the Lord, it's true that I have stood at this door here and other doors, and I will stand there and I remember the words of Moses, and I will say to him, if you do not go with me, I do not want to go. There are times when in my own life where I've said, Lord, unless you're there and I need to know for sure you're there, I don't want to venture out until I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are with me. And the Lord has made it very clear, I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. I am with you. I will walk with you. Though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. I know the Lord is with me, and you should know that too. You should know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is there. Yes, we're having a tough time right now in the United States, but you want to know something? God is still there. God is going to care for us. I have no doubt in my mind. He will not abandon his children. He will care for us. And that's what's taking place here. It says in verse 17, when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, there he is, the man of whom I spoke to you. This one shall reign over my people. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, please tell me, where's the seer's house? And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for you shall eat with me today, and tomorrow I will let you go and will tell you all that is in your heart. But as for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not be anxious about them, for they have been found. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on you and on all your father's house? Saul answered and said, Am I not a, a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then do you speak like this to me? Now Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them into the hall and had them sit in the place of honor among those who were invited. There were about 30 persons, and Samuel said to the cook, Bring the portion which I gave you, uh, of which I said to you, set it apart. So the cook took up the, the thigh with its upper part and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, Here it is, what was kept back, it was set apart for you. Eat, for until this time it has been kept for you, since I said I invited the people. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. And when they had come down from the high place into the city... Samuel spoke with Saul on the top of the house. They arose early, and it was about the dawning of the day that Samuel called to Saul on the top of the house, saying, Get up, that I may send you on your way. Saul arose, and both of them went outside, he and Samuel. As they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to go on ahead of us. And when he went on, But you stand here a while, that I may announce to you the word of God. Now, a couple of interesting things, and I'm going to wrap this up briefly. Isn't it interesting how the Lord speaks to Samuel and says to him, that's Saul. We wanted to make sure that there was no mistake made. And so the Lord points that out. That's Saul. You go and minister to him. This is the one that's going to reign over my people. But notice verse 18. Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, please tell me where is the seer's house. This tells me that Samuel was an ordinary looking person. He didn't glow in the dark. You know, he wasn't hovering there. Oh, that's a very holy person. He was just an average person. You know, sometimes we get caught up with medieval art and we see all these people, saints and, and all from the Old Testament, and they have little halos about them as if they had halos. They didn't have that holy glow about them. They were average people. And so he walks in and doesn't even recognize this guy for who he is. But as he's speaking to him, uh, we note that, that uh, Samuel speaks to him in such a way as to give us some insight. Because, I want you to see this. In verse 20, he says to him that he is the desire of all Israel. I want you to see that. You are the desire of all Israel. You are the focus of Israel's attention. You are the desire of their heart. Now, here's your, here's your application. They desire you but they have rejected God. They had God as their king. They had God who went before them, but they didn't want God going before them anymore. Remember how they had said in chapter 8, 
we also want to be like all the nations that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Well, before they had him, they had God who did that. Exodus 15, 2 and 3 says, The Lord is my strength and song. He's become my salvation. He is my God. I will praise him. My Father's God. I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. There was this mentality that God goes before us and fights our battles. But you don't want God to fight your battle. You want a man to fight your battle is what he's saying. You don't want God to go before you. You want a man who's wealthy, who's tall, who's handsome, who's young. You want a man to be the one who brings victory when in reality you have to look to your God. I get a magazine called Outreach Magazine. And it's interesting in this magazine they gave some statistics through a recent poll. They said 36% of those polled believe in UFOs. 80% believe in God. 59% believe in a literal devil. 24% believe in reincarnation. And 31% of those polled believe in astrology. And only 36% believe the Bible is God's word. How does it happen for the nation to turn away from seeking character or seeking godliness as a nation, righteousness, we get away from the word of God? We have a tendency as a people to do even what the Jews did during the time of Samuel. We are not interested in the things of God. We just don't really care. What we want is we want somebody like Brad Pitt. We want somebody like him to lead us. That's how we are. That's the way it is. That's not brand new. That is something that is, is, is well documented. It's absolutely true. That's what we do. And as a result of that, we reject the oversight of God. That's what the nation of Israel did. And at first, Saul says, how come you're speaking to me like that? I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. It's a very small tribe. There's a, there's a hint of humility there. That doesn't last long. Because once he's given power, that humility is gone. And he becomes a tyrant. You'll see that as we go through this. So what we have is, we have Samuel giving him honor. He hands him a choice piece of meat because that's a picture of honoring him. He says, I've got things to say to you. Tell your servant to move on so I can speak to you things that you need to hear. And he wants to minister to him. So the one who had left his father's house in search of donkeys is called to be a king. But it's an office he's not worthy of. And he's a man that is going to cause Israel to suffer terribly. We must be very careful who we ask for and what we ask for because we just might get it. Father, I ask that you work in us. I ask that you help us to keep you the center of our life. Lord, I, I, I pray as a Christian and I pray as a leader of a Christian church that we believers in Jesus Christ might keep our eyes firmly on you. May we have eyes to see, Lord, learning these lessons. For, for you inspired Paul in the book of Romans to write that the things that were written before were written for our learning. These, these verses that we read are actually intended to train us to have discernment, to know what to look for. I pray that we might learn that. I pray that we as a nation, Lord, would turn to you. May it begin with us individually and spread out. May we have a heart for Jesus Christ, Lord, and a desire to know him in his ways. So I lift up this congregation, beginning with me, my wife, my family, and I pray, Lord Jesus, that our hearts would be yours. Even as our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, perhaps I have some right now who need to get right with the Lord and you need prayer. I want to pray for you right where you're at. If you need to get right with the Lord and you know it, I want to pray for you right now. Would you raise your hand and let me pray for you? Just raise your hand, please. Father, you see these hands. You know the reason why they're being raised to you. I'm asking now in Jesus' name that you would reach down and touch them. Lord, their hands are raised to you. Now I pray that you would reach down and touch them. Whatever the need may be, whether it's a confessing of sin or just a request for help, Lord, whatever it may be, I pray that you touch them now, Lord. And may the burdens be removed. And may they walk out of this place today knowing that you're on their side. 
and you're working, Lord, on their behalf that they might have the joy of knowing they're in right relationship with you from this day forward, Lord. And I bless you for this. Thank you, Lord. You can put your hands down. And Father, I ask that you keep your hands on all of us, that we as a group might learn to love and serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand. Well, we're going to be gone, God knows, and God willing, we'll be back. And so in the meantime, I'm sure that the Lord is going to move tremendously here through guest speakers and music and all. Just keep us in prayer, and we look forward to seeing you when we return. We're due back in April. I think April 2nd is our return date. Hopefully we'll see you then. Let's pray. Father, I lift up right now to you, Lord, this congregation. I pray that we as a church might follow after you. Lord, I also lift up the schools, Lord, here in Chino, Lord, some that are being closed. Lord, throughout this, this state, Lord, a lot of good teachers are, are receiving pink slips, Lord, and I lift them to you right now, Father. I just pray that your hand would be on this system, Lord. I, I ask that you would just bring a healing in every way that is necessary, but that you would be with those right now who are concerned about their finances, their jobs, their situations, Lord. I lift up the kids who are going to be the ones who are suffering in many ways through much of this too, Lord. I just pray that you would, you would guide the parents and, and, and strengthen them in every way. Lord, we just lift these needs to you. We lift up this congregation to you. I pray your hand of blessing and that you would keep them secure, Lord, in your grip. As we leave and as we enjoy the, the joy of seeing your your the country that your eye is on, Lord. I, I pray that we would come back after learning many things that will help us to walk with you and, and make this church uh, even stronger in you, Lord. So we give you all praise. We give you all glory in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.